So we are very happy to have Benjamin Madling uh, today here for the second time. So I just looked it up. Uh, in 2013, he was talking about uh, while doing his dissertation and uh, so finishing up the dissertation, right? It was kind of the, towards the end. So uh, and uh, kind of I had the idea when the book is coming out to bring him back to get a kind of a more full view, a more refined view, which was already then a very intriguing uh, uh, project, uh, dissertation project, and very, what I admire is his uh, kind of uh, groundwork, which he's really doing, um, which I'm really, uh, really uh, a fan of. Um, so uh, he did incredible work on the ground there. Um, let me give you some uh, biographical information for those who don't know him. He got his BA in history uh, in Yale uh, some time ago. Then he got a master in Oxford, of both in history. Then it took him kind of a while, and he had a different side career. Then he came back to history and got his uh, uh, PhD in 2009 in Yale. And he was uh, a postdoctoral fellow uh, at Dartmouth. And then, uh, fortunately, came to Los Angeles, uh, hired by UCLA, uh, where he is now an associate uh, professor. Uh, he, uh, I knew him before. I knew him because uh, one of his many uh, important articles was um, published already in 2004, before he, long before he finished his PhD, uh, which was a comparative article about uh, the UK in California, the Herero in Southwest Africa, and the Tasmanian uh, indigenous population in Tasmania, and the uh, systematic mass violence against all three of them. And this is such an important comparative article that I assigned it immediately to my class, and I still assign it to my students. Um, so he did more of this comparative work, so he's not just an historian on uh, Native Americans in California, so he's uh, so much more. And I think you will notice this when he uh, gives his talk. And I'm happy that he's coming here. And finally, uh, the book, uh, which is based on dissertation, is out. So uh, give him a warm welcome. And we are very intrigued to hear your talk. I have to stop him for a second. Uh, to be a, sh a shameless self-promoter, I will pass around some information about the center, just for everybody to know. We have uh, USC fellowships for summer research, also undergraduate fellowships, but also fellowships for uh, uh, scholars beyond USC, touching up, uh, up on anything related to genocide and Holocaust. So I pass this around. Thank you, Wolf. So first of all, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here at the University of Southern California, which is a world-renowned center for the study of Holocaust and genocide in human experience, not least because of Wolf's leadership and the presence of the Shoah Foundation here on campus. Before we begin, I want to add two caveats right off the bat. One is that the material that I'm about to present this afternoon is of a graphic and quite disturbing nature. And if at any point this afternoon that you feel you just want to get outside and get a breath of air or leave the room, that's absolutely fine. I understand that, and I will not judge you for doing so. The second thing that I want to say is that we're in Indian country. So while what we're talking about today took place long ago, you're in Indian country, you're sitting in Indian country right now, more specifically, Tongva or Gabrielino Indian country. And when you take the metro home, or you drive home, or you take Uber, you'll be in Indian country. And in fact, anywhere you go in this hemisphere, from the Arctic Ocean to the tip of Patagonia, more likely than not, is someone's ancestral home, someone Indian's ancestral home. I just want you to think about that as we begin this discussion. The ceremony continued until just before dawn, illuminated by a central fire Dancers swayed together in ancient rhythms, the women's clamshell beaded necklaces clicking softly against their beaded shell dresses. This is exactly the, the 
regalia I'm talking about pictured right here. Male dancers dressed in the regalia of birds, foxes, deer, and hunters supported the women as they moved in their heavy regalia. Meanwhile, singers raised their voices skyward in the ancient incantations of Nidash, or the feather dance, offering prayers of thanks not only for the creation of the world, but for its renewal in each and every moment. Eventually, they walked away arm in arm, hand in hand, under a full moon, passing through round doorways into snug redwood plank houses with peaked roofs. Unaware that less than eight miles away, white men in Crescent City were preparing to launch yet another expedition California's ever-growing killing machine. California's Coast Rangers and Klamath Mountain Rangers, based in Crescent City, had been well armed by the state. In January of 1854, Governor John Bigler had sent the Klamath judge 50 brand new muskets, 10 rifles, and 1,000 rifle cartridges. By November, the Coast Rangers had 35 new rifles, 3,000 percussion caps, 2,000 rifle cartridges, and four sabers. The Klamath Mountain Rangers, meanwhile, built up an arsenal of over 50 muskets and rifles. These heavily armed militiamen now prepared to do one thing and one thing only, kill California Indian civilians. In the pre-dawn hours of the final day of 1854, as many as 116 of these volunteer state militiamen, accompanied by an unknown number of volunteer auxiliaries, quietly surrounded the village, taking up positions concealed in the brush. At daybreak, as women, men, children, and elders emerged to begin their day, militiamen and vigilantes opened fire. They shot them down, said one eyewitness, just as fast as they could reload their guns. Possessing only three weapons themselves, the Talwa and their Indian guests were unable to adequately defend themselves. A few sought safety by plunging into Lake Earl, attempting to swim away from the village to the opposite shore, but there too they encountered marksmen stationed on the opposite side of the lake who shot them down and killed them in the water. When the killing was over and the screaming had stopped, perhaps hundreds of Indian people were dead. The militia suffered a single reported casualty, and the state of California paid the militiamen for their so-called work. Between the years 1846 and 1870, California's Indian population plunged from perhaps 150,000 individuals to not more than 30,000 people. Diseases, exposure, dislocation, and starvation all played crucial roles in this catastrophe. But there was also something else at work. Abduction, unfree labor, mass death on reservations, individual homicides, and over 300 separate reported massacres also played a major role. In fact, this was a case of what we today call genocide. What makes up genocide as a concept? This is the evaluative rubric that I use in the book to define what happened in California. And according to the UN Genocide Convention, for genocide to take place, a prosecutor must essentially prove two things. First, that the defendant had the intent to destroy the group in whole or in part. And second, that the defendant committed one of the five genocidal acts enumerated here. The convention thus provides scholars with a clear and internationally recognized evaluative rubric for examining instances of genocide, including historical instances of genocide not subject to legal jurisdiction. Now, following the formulation of this new international legal treaty, scholars, led by historians and ethnic studies professors, began re-examining the conquest and colonization of California.
California under US rule. And by the year 2000, more than 20 of them had deemed what happened in California between 1846 and 1873 to be a case of genocide. So you might ask, why did I bother to spend a decade researching and writing this book? Because I wanted to bring genocide studies into conversation with the Native American experience. And because very little until now had been written about the California Indian catastrophe compared to such canonical genocides as the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust, or genocide in, in Rwanda. So building upon previous scholarship, this book then is the first year by year, month by month, week by week, comprehensive recounting of exactly what happened in California during this period. This topic calls for meticulous analysis, and that is in part why you can pull the door open with this book. The stakes, I think, merit this kind of detailed analysis because the stakes are so high, not only for scholars, but also for California Indian people, and in fact, for all Americans. If United States citizens founded some regions of the state of California, if not our state as a whole, upon deliberate attempts to physically exterminate indigenous peoples, scholars will need to reevaluate some of the basic axiomatic assumptions that we have, not only about the history of California, but about the history of these United States. Scholars could, for example, re-examine the assumption that indirect effects of colonization, such as epidemic diseases, rather than direct and intentional effects of colonization, like mass murder, were the leading cause of death in relations between American Indian peoples and newcomers. Exceptionalist interpretations of the history of the United States also come under fire as scholars may begin, for example, to compare genocidal events in California to genocides in other places, perhaps Australia. Where scholars document a genocide, it then becomes necessary to carefully evaluate what roles government and private individuals play, as well as whether or not the genocide was part of a regional pattern, a national pattern, or perhaps even a hemispherical. Larger questions then follow. What tended to catalyze genocide? Who ordered and carried out the killing? Why do we not know more about these events? Did democracy drive murder? And ultimately, what role did genocide play in the making of the modern United States, Canada, and the other nations of the Western Hemisphere? Given its political, economic, psychological, and health ramifications, the question of genocide in California is particularly urgent for the state's 150,000 self-reported California Indians. Should these 110 federally recognized communities and 70 non-recognized communities press for government apologies, reparations, or control of land where genocidal events took place? Will California tribes marshal evidence of genocide in cases involving tribal sovereignty and federal recognition? How should they commemorate victims of mass murder while also emphasizing successful resistance, accommodation, survival, and cultural renaissance? The psychological issues are also from what happens when a tribal member learns that he or she is the descendant of both survivors of genocide and perpetrators of genocide. How might California Indian people reconcile often intense patriotism with knowledge that employees of the federal government organized and carried out much of the killing? Finally, what role might acknowledgement of genocide have on the intergenerational historical trauma prevalent in so many California Indian communities and that historical trauma's direct connection to major human health concerns. For example, the highest rate of suicide among any group of citizens in California. The 
question of genocide also poses explosive issues for all Americans. Should government officials tender public apologies like those offered by Presidents George Herbert Walker Bush and Ronald Reagan for the forcible relocation and internment of some 120,000 Japanese Americans, many of them Californians, during the Second World War? Should federal officials offer compensation along the lines of the more than $1.6 billion that the United States Congress has now offered to 82,210 of these Japanese Americans and their heirs? Might California state officials decrease their cut of California Indians' $7.3 billion a year in annual gaming revenues, perhaps as a way of paying reparations? A better understanding of California's genocide might also impact the federal government's dealings with the scores of California Indian communities currently seeking formal recognition from the United States government. The question of commemoration is then closely linked. Will non-Indian people support or even tolerate the public commemoration of mass murders committed by some of the state's founding men with the same kinds of monuments, museums, and state legislated days of remembrance that today commemorate both the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust? Will genocides against California Indians join these mass murders in our public school curricula or in our public discourse? These questions are very important, but they can only be addressed in very limited ways without a comprehensive understanding of the relations between Native people and newcomers between 1846 and 1873. Now, sporadic mass killings of California Indian people punctuated the initial years of U.S. rule here in California. But it was James Marshall's 1848 gold strike that precipitated a local genocide. Oregon men coming south for gold played a leading role in increasing violence against California Indian people. These Oregonian 48ers rarely had an understanding or a connection to California's Hispanic economy and society in which indigenous peoples played important roles not only as field workers and as cowboys, but also as wives and politicians. In 1849, Oregonian attacks on California Indian people increased in both frequency and in lethality, particularly in the Nisanan and Miwok lands here in the central mines where the gold rush was then booming. One 49er explained, and I quote, Oregon people had been used to shooting Indians, and they did shoot them freely in the California gold mines. That April, one miner recorded in his diary events at the epicenter of this emerging genocide. Coloma, here at Sutter's Mill, where gold had first been found. In the central mines, he and others recounted multiple massacres, scalpings of Indian people, the beheadings of Indian people, and the slaying of surrendered Indian civilians. Due to spotty primary source con coverage, we will probably never know the precise number of California Indian people who were killed in 1849 in the central mines. Sorry. But sure what was clear to observers was the exterminatory nature of these killings, not only in their intent, but also in their impact. They were seeing the literal vanishing of California Indian communities. Further to the west, just north of San Francisco Bay, the slaying of two white ranchers at what is now Kelseyville here on the shores of Clear Lake marked a turning point toward a larger statewide genocide. In response to this double homicide, vigilantes and United States Army soldiers killed as many as 1,000 Indian people or more between late December 1849 and late May 1850. Vigilantes first murdered and massacred large numbers of California Indian farm and ranch workers in the Napa and Sonoma Valleys. Then, after authorities arrested eight of these vigilantes, California's Supreme Court let them go on bail, its very first case, and never chose to prosecute these individuals. 
Meanwhile, the United States Army sought to avenge the deaths of these two white ranchers in its own way. In an article titled Horrible Slaughter of Indians, one San Francisco newspaper described a major massacre committed by the United States Army on the shores of Clear Lake with information provided directly by a U.S. Army captain, and I quote, they poured in a destructive fire indiscriminately upon men, women, and children. They fell as grass before the sweep of the scythe. Little or no resistance was offered, and the work of butchery was of but short duration. Neither sex nor age was spared. It was the order of extermination, fearfully obeyed. As many as 800 people may have died in this one day atrocity. Other killings followed, and the officers involved were not promoted, but were promoted. In fact, all of them either became United States Army generals or later governors of the state of California. So a new factor was at work, large-scale extended vigilante and United States Army killing campaigns tolerated by both state and federal authorities. As the gold rush continued, immigrants surged into the state. Before the discovery of gold in California, there were perhaps 13 or maybe 14,000 non-Indian individuals living here in California. But as you can see from this graph, by the year 1860, there were over 360,000 newcomers. This was, in fact, the single largest mass migration in the history of the United States up to that time. The newcomers came primarily in search of wealth, but in seeking to access gold, eat, dress, acquire labor, and satisfy their sexual desires, immigrants placed immense pressures upon the indigenous peoples of California. These demands triggered an explosion of ranching, hunting, mining, and slave raping. These activities generated shockwaves that had a devastating impact upon California's Indian peoples. California's new leaders magnified that impact. During the period of martial law, United States <coughs> Army officers turned California Indians into legal subjects with few rights, subjecting them, for example, to harsh punishments, <coughs> whippings, and setting up a system that legalized unfree labor. In 1850, California's first elected legislature met for the first time, and in the first three months <coughs> in office, they banned all California Indian people from voting, they banned Indians with one half or more of Indian <coughs> blood from providing testimony for or against whites in civil and criminal cases. And they later banned California Indian people from serving as jurors or as attorneys. In combination, these laws shut California Indian people out of participation in and protection by the state's legal system. Abduction played a major role in the California Indian population. In 1850, also in its first three months, the new legislature passed an act for the government and protection of Indians, which legalized white custody of Indian minors and Indian prisoner leasing, while allowing courts and juries to summarily reject Indian testimony in such cases. Indian people could thus be forced into unpaid work for indeterminate periods of time on trumped up charges. What we're looking at here is a document that I found UC Berkeley's Bancroft uh, Library, and what it says up here in French is 16-year-old Southern California Indian female at the price of a pound of gunpowder and a bottle of brandy. It's from sometime in the 1850s. <coughs> Ten years later, in 1860, California's legislators extended that 1850 act to legalize the indenture of any Indian or Indians. These laws triggered a boom in slavery. It had three devastating impacts upon California Indian people. First of all, the slave raids themselves were highly lethal. If, for example, we were a California Indian community and slave raiders poured in through that door, I and all of the other adult men in this room would immediately be killed. 
All women over about 35 would also be killed, and anybody who was left would be tied up uh, with lassos and dragged away for sale as a slave. So that was the first devastating impact of slavery. The second devastating impact was that it separated men and women at their peak years of reproduction, making it very difficult for communities to biologically reproduce themselves. Third, because it was so inexpensive to acquire unfree Indian laborers, they were often treated as disposable. I'll give you an example. Right here in Los Angeles, one lawyer recalled, and I quote, Los Angeles had its slave mart in the center of town, and thousands of honest, useful people were absolutely destroyed in this way. Indeed, between 1850 and 1870, Indian population, as recorded by census takers here in Los Angeles, plummeted from 3,669 to just 219 people. Escape was one way that California Indian people could resist servitude, but whites often responded with lethal force. For example, the Lassic Wailaki Indian woman Lucy Young, pictured here in this photograph, escaped servitude multiple times and recollected, I'll quote this for you. Young woman been stole by white people. Come back, shot through lights and liver. Front skin hang down like apron. She tie up with cotton dress, never die neither. Others who attempted to escape were less fortunate. After one California Indian woman fled her, quote, lord and master with his Indian boy, end quote, whites massacred not only her and her son, but 13 other people in their village. Two years later, a white rancher on the Van Dusen River became so incensed after his Indian servant visited his family just half a mile away that he, quote, slaughtered the whole family, six persons, boy and all. Despite such reports, state and federal policymakers failed to intervene, while almost all law enforcement officials turned a blind eye. Congress made, meanwhile, made California Indian people particularly vulnerable immigration's blast. In the year 1851 and 1852, federal treaty agents, they're the three men pictured here uh, in the bottom of this gold print portrait, signed 18 treaties with 119 California Indian communities, allocating them 7,488,000 acres, or approximately 7.5% of the state. However, United States senators meeting in secret session repudiated all of these treaties, and in fact, they did not come into the public eye until the 20th century. Instead, in 1853, Congress authorized five temporary military reservations, not to exceed 25,000 acres each. Now, the results of this were devastating. They set the stage for genocide, and they were fourfold. First, no <coughs> reservations were patented, and as, as a result, jurisdiction over them was left uncertain. Second, California Indian people did not become the explicit wards of the federal government. Third, because jurisdiction remained uncertain, confusion and conflict among and between state and federal agencies on these reservations prevailed. Finally, U.S. Major General John Wool's declaration denied these reservations full army protection, and I quote, until these reservations are perfected, they cannot be fully occupied by U.S. troops, and U.S. troops have no right to exclude whites from entering or occupying the land of the reserves, or even to prevent whites taking Indian women and children from them. Federal officials thus made California Indians vulnerable, even on reservations, to kidnapping, slavery, assault, and mass murder. The establishment of the state of California's militia system now marked the rise of the state-sponsored killing machine. Between the years 1850 and 1861, 3,414 California militiamen participated in two dozen, that's 24, separate state militia operations that killed, at a very minimum, 1,342 Indian people. However, their impact transcended these numbers. Militiamen served as a widely publicized state endorsement of Indian killing, communicating an unofficial 
legal grant of impunity to would-be Indian killers, thus inspiring many vigilantes to take up guns, swords, and knives against California Indians. In fact, vigilantes killed at a minimum over 6,400 Indian people during this period. If you think that all of this killing is the act of sort of rogue agents, you have to understand that genocidal intent is only thinly veiled. In January of 1851, this man, California Governor Peter Burnett, our very first elected US governor of California, declared, and I quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged until the Indian race becomes extinct. This is not in a private letter or in his journal. This is in his State of the State address to the Joint Assembly and Senate of the state. Soon thereafter, state legislators in both houses put the power of the purse behind anti-Indian militia operations. In February, that's the very next month, legislators voted to take out a loan for $500,000, a vast amount of money at this time pay for both past and future anti-Indian militia operations. Meanwhile, the state of California began building up a substantial arsenal of arms and ammunition donated to them directly by the United States Army. Then, that same year, in May, the state passed a $600,000 bond measure to support additional operations. What we're looking at is one of these actual bonds taken from the archive. You see George Washington there on the far right, and Indian here at the top. And they've been detached, but there would be coupons hanging off that the bondholder would take uh, in, and they would claim their coupon, which would be the payment of their interest. And at the very end, the last coupon would pay them back the principal. They were issued in a variety of different denominations, as low as $50, which meant that this could be a, a kind of investment open not only to institutional investors like Wells Fargo, but also to individuals. For some California Indian people, the pattern of exterminatory attacks was now all too clear. After genocidal massacres by militiamen in 1854, one Modoc leader announced at a tribal council near the Oregon border, I quote, we have lived here in peace but cannot get along with these white people. They come and they kill us for nothing. Not only our men, but women and children. He concluded, they will hunt us down like the deer and the antelope. The Sikion Indian woman, Sally Bell, pictured here, provided a rare California Indian eyewitness account of a massacre that took place in her homeland on the northwest coast amongst the redwoods sometime in 1850. Bell remembered, and I quote, about 10 o'clock in the morning, some white men came. They killed my grandfather, and my father, and my mother. I saw them do it. Then they killed my baby sister, and cut her heart out, and threw it in the brush where I had run to hide. My little sister was a baby, just crawling around, did not know what to do. I was so scared. I guess I just hid there a long time with my little sister's heart clutched in my hands. It was a terrifying time to be a California Indian. The United States Congress now endorsed such killing. In 1854, Congress allocated over $924,000 to reimburse the state of California not only for its past militia campaigns, but also for those that might occur in the future. Predictably, a new surge of both militia and vigilante killings followed, even as state leaders worked to perfect the killing machine. State Quartermaster and Adjutant General William Kibbe, pictured here, wrote his own book of tactics and made sure that a copy was distributed to each and every one of his militia officers throughout the state. That Christmas, Jefferson C. Davis, then Secretary of War, sent a crate of militia manuals from the Department of War to be distributed to those same officers. And in the year 1857, the state 
of legislators appropriated an additional $410,000 for militia operations. Finally, in 1861, Congress appropriated an additional $400,000 to pay the expenses of a new wave of militia operations. U.S. congressmen thus indirectly sanctioned the mass murder of California Indian people after the fact. Although California Indian people routinely resisted, civilians and state and federal officials carried out a series of large removal operations to try to force all surviving California Indian people onto those temporary military reservations that we discussed earlier. For example, in the year 1856, vigilantes massacred 55 Indian people in the process of forcibly removing their community to the Mendocino Reservation. The Lake Yakuts woman, Yoimut, recollected that during the forced removal of her community to the Fresno Reservation in the Central Valley, U.S. soldiers killed a dozen Indian people. The Nome Lackey man, Andrew Freeman, explained, and I quote, when I took the Indians to Round Valley Reservation, they drove us like stock shot old people who could not make the trip. They would shoot the children who were getting tired. Once survivors arrived at federal reservations in California, they often encountered both institutionalized malnutrition and lethal starvation. The Concow leader Tomayanem recollected that after volunteers forcibly moved his people to the Mendocino Reservation, and I quote, we were very hungry cows began to die very fast. Other reservations proved little better. In about 1860, Tomeyanem and his community chose to move south to the Round Valley Reservation, where he remembered, and I quote, there was even less to eat. Indeed, by 1860, federal officials provided 480 to 910 calories per day to working Round Valley Reservation Indians. By 1862, Daily rations fell to 160 to 390 <coughs> calories per person per day, further diminishing these already inadequate rations. Those who did not work were infrequently fed, if at all. A reservation at this point possessed hundreds of cattle, yet by design, Indians were allowed no meat. If some California reservation inmates died of institutionalized starvation, Malnutrition weakened the immune systems of others, increasing their susceptibility to lethal diseases. Starvation and malnutrition also predictably depressed fecundity while increasing both miscarriages and stillbirths. Some reservation officials and colonists also used unpaid reservation Indians with lethal results. According to one colonist, and I quote, about 300 died on the Round Valley Reservation during the winter of 1856 to from the effects of packing them through the mountains in the snow and mud. They were generally worked naked and packed 50 pounds, if able. At California reservations, willful neglect took an untold number of lives. But federal officials also killed California Indians in more direct ways. During the United States Civil War, 15,725 white California men enlisted in the Union Army, dwarfing all previous mobilizations in California's history. Most of these men remained in California, and they soon transformed California's killing machine. As U.S. troops, these so-called California volunteers replaced relatively small, short-term militia vigilante operations with much larger, longer-term United States Army operations. Vigilante operations flourished alongside these army campaigns, but the genocide was now primarily a federal project. United States Army forces killed substantial numbers. The very first California Volunteers campaign killed over 120 people in its first two weeks in the field. Hundreds more would die in succeeding campaigns led by officers like this man, Henry M. Black. California Volunteers also killed prisoners en masse on multiple occasions. Cavalry Captain Moses McLaughlin proudly reported how in the year 1863 near Bakersfield, I had all the bucks collected together and 35 were either sabered or shot. Not one escaped. McLaughlin concluded that 
the statement of genocidal intent. They will soon all either be killed off or driven so far into these surrounding deserts that they will perish by famine. The U.S. Army continued killing California Indians until the fall of 1873, when they hanged four surrendered Modoc leaders, decapitated them, and shipped their heads to Washington, D.C. The California Indian catastrophe fits the two-part legal definition set forth in the UN Genocide Convention. First, perpetrators demonstrated both in word and in deed their intent to destroy. Killing occurred in more than 370 separate massacres, as well as hundreds of individual homicides and executions. Sources indicate that between the years 1846 and 1873, vigilantes, militiamen, and soldiers killed at least 9,492 to 16,094 California Indian people, and probably by many more. By way of contrast, sources indicate that California Indian people killed fewer than 1,500 non-Indians during this entire time period. But other acts of genocide also proliferated too. Many rapes and beatings occurred, and these meet the convention's definition of causing serious bodily harm to victims on the basis of their group identity and with the intent to destroy the group. The sustained military and civilian policy of burning down Indian villages and food stores while forcing survivors into inhospitable high-altitude locations also amounted to deliberately creating conditions of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the group in whole or in part. And some Office of Indian Affairs officials administering federal Indian reservations in California committed the same crime. Further, because malnutrition and exposure, exposure predictably lowered fertility, some state and federal decision makers also appear guilty of imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Finally, the state of California, slave raiders, and federal officials were all deeply involved in the forcible transfer of children from the group to another group. 3,000 to 4,000 California Indian children were subject to such forced transfers just between 1850 and 1868 alone. By breaking up families and communities, forced removals constituted imposing measures intended to prevent births. Sufficient evidence that exists to designate what happened here in California during these years to be a case of genocide, according to the UN definition. Elected officials were the primary architects of annihilation here in the state, our state officials. But the U.S. Army also played a crucial role in this genocide, first creating an exclusionary legal system, then setting genocidal precedents, helping to build the killing machine, participating in the killing, and ultimately taking direct control of it. In total, the United States Army soldiers here in California killed between 1,688 and 3,741 California Indian people. And again, I think these numbers are quite conservative. It's probably many more during this time period. If state legislators were the main architects of this genocide, federal officials helped to lay the groundwork, became the final arbiters of its design, and ultimately paid for most of its official execution. Now, like California Indians, Native American peoples across this country and throughout this hemisphere suffered devastating population declines following the arrivals of newcomers. Before contact, at least five million indigenous people populated what is now the continental United States. And by 1900, federal census takers recorded fewer than 250,000 survivors. Disease, colonialism, and war all played important roles in this catastrophe. But you have to wonder, was something more sinister also to blame? Academics have long debated whether or not Native Americans or any particular groups of them suffered genocide during the conquest and colonization of the Americas. And the debate is hung up really on two issues. First, not all participants agree on what genocide is. And second, they don't agree on the scope. What should they study? Are they talking about 
all of the Americas from Patagonia to the Arctic from 1491 to the present? Or were they talking about a particular one year period? The direct and deliberate killing of California Indian people between 1846 and 1873 was more lethal and more sustained than anywhere else in the history of the United States or its colonial antecedents. But there remains, I think, a pressing need for additional case studies addressing other regions and peoples, both within and beyond the United States. The variables present in the California genocide did not recur in precisely the same combinations or at the same exact intensities in the histories of all other Native American peoples. In some other cases, disease was the overwhelming cause of mortalities. Both state and federal or colonial and metropolitan decision makers were not directly complicit in every case. Other Indian peoples <laughs> employed very different survival strategies. For example, fleeing contact zones or killing large numbers of colonizers and driving them away. Finally, in other cases, colonizers may have committed fewer or no genocidal crimes, while the rates and causes of death differed. We need to build, I think, on our existing knowledge of indigenous history with new research in order to create a fuller, clearer picture for the United States, North America, and the entire Western Hemisphere. However, this book presents, I think, a workable methodology for examining potential cases in the Americas and beyond. The first issue is definition. The UN Genocide Convention provides us with a standardized, internationally recognized rubric and a coherent legal definition that may be consistently applied. This book suggests that scholars should rigorously examine each and every case of potential genocide in consistent terms. Just as important, we should consider each on a case-by-case -case basis, not just in California, but nationally and internationally, to create a scholarly precision in our use of what is an undeniably explosive term, and to seriously consider the balance between the five genocidal crimes enumerated in the convention and factors like epidemic disease. Thus, without claiming a universality of the California case, I hope that this book points the field toward a clear and consistent definitional standard, as well as application. Detailed case studies are an important part of genocide studies, a field often dominated by theoretical and especially definitional debates, because case studies provide a powerful tool with which to understand genocide and combat its denial around the world. Native Americans experienced and reacted to conquest and colonization in a wide variety of ways. Rigorously examining this range of cases using the Genocide Convention to evaluate both genocidal intent and genocidal acts will help to move the discussion of genocide in the United States and the Americas toward clarity. Unbraiding each region and people's story from tapestry of American Indian history and bringing each into sharper, more vivid relief will create a clearer portrait of Native American experiences and of United States history as a whole. These investigations will be painful, but they will help all of us, both Indian and non-Indian, to make more accurate sense of our past and ourselves. places where we can see quite vividly and clearly genocidal campaigns. For example, the Pequot War of the 1630s um, in what was then colonial Connecticut, colonial New York, is uh, quite a similar experience in that this is an example on the other side of the continent um, in another century that replicates a lot of the factors that constitute genocide. For example, 
there are very clear and vivid statements of genocidal intent, both before, during, and after the killing. And there's also quite clearly a whole series of exterminatory killing campaigns that take place there. But what I'm calling for here uh, is for maybe even people in this room to undertake some of this very difficult, granular, detailed work, which really involves excavating every document you can find related to a time and place. Um, perhaps every oral history, if the research takes one in that direction, to try to create a very, very dense narrative of precisely what happened with a particular indigenous nation or a particular region in a, in a limited time period. How did you choose 1873 as the end of your study? So 1873 really marks the last direct major concerted killing campaign. The United States Army and California and Oregon volunteers, 1872-1873, Modoc War. But it's also an important turning point. It's how I end the book, because it's even during this war that we see the changeover in policy. We see activists like Lucretia Mott uh, and many others writing letters to the highest level of government, including United States President Ulysses S. Grant, asking him, first of all, not to make this a genocidal war, and then not to kill all of the surviving men. So we see that process happening in that particular contract. There's also something very important that happens in 1873, which is uh, the coming, uh, coming in of a brand new uh, criminal and civil code in the state of California, which allows uh, people like Indians to provide testimony has to be admissible to court, uh, at least according to these new uh, civil and criminal codes. It doesn't mean that courts didn't ignore them. It doesn't mean that the courts suddenly became fair. In fact, the very first California Indian person to pass the bar and be admitted to the bar in the state of California only did so in the year of my birth, 1971. So it's taken a very long time for us to have even any kind of uh, real participation in the state's legal system. But 1873 is a clear turning point, not only in policy, but also in law. So that's why I chose that. Could you describe a little bit about your methodology in writing the book? Like, sure. It, for, thank you for your talk also. Hang on just a second. Uh, well, I guess the first word would be obsessive, <laughs> <laughs> relentless. Um, I was so focused on getting all the material that even after I finished my PhD and graduated in 2009, I chose not to take a postdoctoral fellowship and go back east, but to stay in place at UC Berkeley and do another year of intensive research. And even when I finally had to get a job and I went to Dartmouth College and was a postdoc there and started teaching, I spent a huge amount of time in their archive and realized that Dartmouth's rare books and manuscripts archive had yet more information that I could glean. The other part of this, besides the, the written material, was, and this might be what you're asking about, um, my method of visiting California Indian communities. So I did a lot of traveling to California Indian communities. I did not do the IRB. This is not an oral history project. But I wanted to present my work to culture committees, to tribal councils, to as many elders and members as possible so that I could find out what I was getting right very important part of my research process. For one thing, I think that it's ethical to do this. Uh, just in case anybody's wondering, I'm a pale male from Yale, and not a California Indian person. So this is not my history. So it wasn't history that I knew from the inside out. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting things wrong. I think that's the ethical approach in ethnic history. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't revealing things community members did not want revealed. There was ethno-botanical material that I excised because people said, don't talk about that. People didn't want the locations of their acorn groves discussed. Didn't want people to know where particular plant fibers are growing that have been growing and have been tended for thousands of years to make beautiful baskets. Um, so there were things that I pulled back on. There were also a lot of errors that were corrected this way. Uh, you know, I remember uh, going 
I, I thought I was presenting a picture of this man, Kintguash, in Chilliquin, Oregon, visiting the Klamath tribes. And everybody started laughing when I threw up my first slide because it's an image of Kintguash, Captain Jack, that's in a lot of books, that's actually an Arapaho man. And so I was really thankful to community members that they could keep me from humiliating myself and also keep me from misrepresenting uh, somebody that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, Kintkuash, Captain Jack, the leader of the Modoc people uh, in the last Modoc War. Another thing that happened was that I received oral testimony from songs and traditions and just having coffee with people that led me to evidence. So uh, a Talawa elder, maybe on my seventh trip to Smith River Rancheria, pulled me aside and she said, okay, now I trust you. You've been through your seventh time here. We know you're serious about this. And so there is a song about the time when everything was on fire. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. She said, I'm pretty sure it's in the middle 1850s. Okay. So she said, I have this idea. Why don't you go and look at ship's logs, see if you can find some ships that pass through. And she was right. Ship's logs of ships traveling up and down the Pacific coast talk about going just north of Crescent City and seeing all these fires out of season in fall when there shouldn't be any fires. So that gave me the clue as to when this was happening. Then I started to look for people who might have been there. And a wonderful librarian at Bancroft said, you know, there's this, this famous writer, Pfeiffer. She was an Austrian travel writer. And lo and behold, she had a book, I think it was called An Austrian Woman's Journey Around the World, published in 1854. She went from San Francisco on her travel around the world up to Crescent City. She hired a Swiss guy who was a miner that spoke the same language. He took her in the heart of the genocide as it was unfolding. And so in her travel memoir published in German, she's describing not only seeing refugees streaming out of villages that had recently been burned down, she actually she becomes an eyewitness bearing witness to some of these extreme acts of violence. So that's another thing that I learned from this process is that there will be clues provided to you as a researcher by going to Indian country and talking to people who know far more than you ever will about the topic that can lead you to some really startling pieces of evidence and some, some new important understandings about what happened from an indigenous perspective. What do you think the evidence of the women's So this is something that I go into in, in great depth in the book in a lot, from a lot of different angles. So there were different motives for different people, and they often record their motives. But the real bedrock of what created an ideology that allowed people to slaughter babies, to bayonet babies or throw children into fires and burn them alive, the bedrock of that is really the core of Indian hating. American history. And that bedrock is really about viewing indigenous people as non-humans. Viewing indigenous people as beasts or literally as satanic demons incarnate. That then is directly connected to what I call in the book the myth of inevitable extinction, which goes back to the very beginning of colonization not only in places like Virginia, but also in colonial New England, there is writing that describes indigenous people as non-humans or as demons, but that explains away their rapid population decline, either as the will of God, providence. So Winthrop and Cotton Mather celebrated uh, the Pequot genocide, which I mentioned earlier, saying that this was the will of God. Puritans explain pandemics that swept away communities as providence. A little bit later, added to this providential explanation of the myth of inevitability is a biological one, a sort of proto-social Darwinist notion that indigenous people are biologically inferior and somehow cannot withstand the biological onslaught of a whole new host of organisms, most notably the Anglo-Saxon. So in this literature in the 19th century, 
not only do you sometimes hear people talking about the destruction of California Indians as the will of God, but also as a kind of natural metaphor. For example, the Indians will evaporate like the dew on the blossom of the rose before the rising Anglo-Saxon sun, something like that. You hear a lot of things like that. Why is this so powerful and valuable? Because it takes the human hand off of the tiller of history and replaces it either with the hand of God or the hand of nature. This is extremely powerful because it allows advocates of genocide, be they newspaper editors or politicians or militia leaders or US army generals, to tell the men doing the killing, oh, don't worry, you're merely speeding the inevitable. You're immediately speeding up the will of God or the will of nature, destiny. And I think this was somehow quite comforting to people as the fundamental way that they could understand things. So you'll see newspaper editors or even politicians saying, it's more humane to kill all the Indians now than to let them die a slow, lingering death. Literally, they, they will they say that, and you'll see that in this book. But the more the proximate causes are often greed. It was very remunerative to kill Indians. There were private killers who were paid by the scalp or who were paid for their days in the field. There were public subscriptions to pay them. Militiamen could often earn far more killing Indians than they could earn mining gold. And there were bounties offered to them to sign up. So California volunteers got a bounty funded by the state of California, signed off by Governor Leyland Stanford to pay men join the U.S. Army, knowing that almost all of those Union soldiers that signed up in here in California would be tasked with hunting down and killing up or removing Indians to reservations. It's a big book. There's a lot in here. <laughs> if there were reparations, would it come from the state or would it come from the federal government? And is there a statute of limitations on genocide? Well, so first of all, because these crimes took place after the UN Genocide Convention was created, the UN Genocide Convention has no applicability here, has no applicability to anything before it was created. So that, that sort of answers that question. Reparations are an open question. Reparations, I don't think, have any statute of limitations. And different countries around the world have dealt with reparations related to genocide and crimes against humanity in a wide variety. I think that it's not really for me to answer what we should do, because I'm a scholar and historians are not at their best when they make policy prognostications and recommendations. And other people are especially trained to do that. But more important to that is that this is an issue for California Indian individuals, elected California Indian officials, and California Indian communities, I hope to set the pace on because this impacts their lives in the most direct and powerful way, far more than it impacts my life. So I think it's, it's up to them to take the lead, but there are a whole variety of ways in which this could be handled. And I think that it's both the federal government and the state government that, that owe reparations here. Sir. Thank you, uh, this has been a very uh, powerful talk. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about religious and racial difference. Um, and also with, uh, I was wondering, were there any missionaries involved uh, with native groups at this time? And if genocide played out differently um, in sort of Northern California and then among mission Indian communities? Yeah, so if we, I'm just gonna go back to a map here. So the 21 missions have a major impact on California Indian history. The first one established right down here in San Diego in 1769. The last one established under Mexico will right up here in Sonoma. Between 1769 and 1836, approximately 81,000 California Indian people were baptized in those 21 missions. And of those 81,000, approximately 61,000 were buried. 
So you didn't have a very good shot at living once you'd been baptized and went out of mission. Um, there's lots of statistics I won't go into. So in that period, the, the mission period, which you really could say runs from 1769 to 1845, there is a population catastrophe, especially along this band here. So the densest settled areas in Southern California, to answer your question about North and South, had already been largely depopulated during that period of time. We could call, call it the Russo-Hispanic period, because of course there's also the Russian colony here at Fort Ross, which also has a devastating demographic impact on Pomo people and Coast Miwok people up there. Uh, in the American period, the missions go into a radical decline. Many of them are completely abandoned. The basis of P.O. Pico's fortune, you know, Pico Boulevard out here, is stripping the mission of everything. It's laborers, it's silver, it's China, all its wealth, and it's land and capital. When the gold rush happens, there aren't a lot of religious leaders who followed the gold rush, as far as I can tell. Churches happen later. <clears throat> in the 1850s, but they don't seem to have preached, as far as I can tell, against the genocide in a major way. But this could be a very fruitful avenue of research, to try to understand what happened with uh, church and synagogue leaders uh, during this time, because all kinds of denominations are springing up in the 1850s and 1860s. And, and perhaps uh, non-Judeo-Christian religious leaders as well are practicing in other immigrant communities that are surging <clears throat> into the state. But I did not find religious leaders who are publicly standing up, writing essays in newspapers and magazines, or being quoted in the state assembly or the state senate, standing up for any people. But there were upstanders. And, Wherever I found those people, I tried to highlight what they did. And those upstanders were people like Senator Crittenden from Kentucky, standing up on behalf of Indians in the US Senate. Um, they were US Army officers who said, vigilantes, if you come up here, you'll find someone other than women and children to fight. So there were people who stood up. My favorite story about this, maybe one of the most poignant, took place right near where I was born, up here, near Redding. And the killing squads were going all through the upper Sacramento River Valley, killing all of the Yana Indian farm workers, kind of between Redding and Red Bluff. And she heard the shots going off outside, and the men were killed. And there were three women working with her in the kitchen. And she was pregnant. She stood up in front of the three women and held up a quilt so they were behind the quilt, and she was standing in front. She said to these killers, if you want to kill these three women, you're going to have to kill me and my unborn child. And so they left, and then her husband and some other ranchers gathered up all the Indian workers that they could find on the surrounding ranches and took them across the valley to the Trinity River area where they could be at least temporarily safe. We don't know what happened to those people. So as in some other genocides, there are righteous individuals who risk their own lives uh, to stand up for Indian people. Unfortunately, they seem to have been few and far between. There seems to be a broad-based anti-Indian consensus in the halls of power and in the general public, because the general public kept electing people who were willing to vote for these things. Well, thank you for your research, Ben. Um, I guess my question might be a little pedantic, but um, is there any utility in kind of divorcing or separating the terminology of genocide from, say, ethnic cleansing the way Gary Johnson might have used it? Or how do you see that kind of? Well, I think these are two very different terms, and I'll tell you why. Uh, ethnic cleansing is a euphemism that is not grounded in international law anywhere that I'm aware of. Uh, it's broadly described in a lot of different ways. Uh, and the Genocide Convention actually has teeth. There are, uh, by my last count, in the screen over, there are 62 people currently serving prison sentences for genocide, people who've been tried by the International Criminal Court for the Yugo former Yugoslavia, International Criminal Court for Rwanda, uh, the International Criminal 
court, and there are ongoing trials happening right now, not only in the ICC, but also <coughs> in the extraordinary courts in the chambers of Cambodia, the so-called Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Phnom Penh. Okay. So part of my interest, I'll be quite explicit about this, part of my interest in foregrounding this definition is not only in order to create a unitary definition, but also because this is a definition that more and more genocide scholars are using. And because by using it, we support an increasingly important international legal regime that every couple of weeks is further defined and more clearly supported by a body of case law. So a law is passed by a legislative body, in this case the United Nations, um, but then it gets further defined and we understand all of its particularities by the case law that is developed in these extraordinarily complicated cases. I mean, these are these are like homicide cases under US law, but times 100. And there's a reason for that, because this is the crime of crimes. This is the most extreme criminal activity that we can imagine. And so it needs to have an extremely high standard of proof and an extremely high standard of evidence, not only for intent, but also for the commission of <coughs> Maybe getting too specific, but is is there a what is the correlation between the militias of the 1850s and the California Volunteers that came about during the Civil War? This is a really interesting question, and uh, well, a lot of times they they have the same officers. So the officer who might have been in charge. Yes. The officer in charge of the Stockton, I think it's the Stockton Militia, um, he becomes a U.S. General uh, of California Volunteers. There, there are many others. Uh, and, and then also there is a connection between the sort of the propaganda and the California Volunteers. Some of the men who owned or were editors of the leading anti-Indian newspapers then become officers leading California Volunteers units. So there's there's quite a connection between those um, that I can think of. But I, there's probably a lot more work that can be done, and the records of the California Volunteers are voluminous and extremely detailed. We have at our fingertips much of the correspondence related to the Civil War. It's all been digitally archived and it's keyword searchable. So we can find uh, people like Patrick O'Connor, who I just mentioned from Stockton. You can just look through the volumes of the records of the War of the Rebellion and find every letter that he sent and every letter that he received and sort of trace his experiences and actions during the Civil War period. And when I say Civil War, I, my conception of it is sort of a long Civil War because Many of these California volunteers did not muster out until 1868. So long after Lee surrendered at Appomattox and Jefferson Davis is captured and the last Confederate general, Stan Wadey, surrenders in the Western Theater, the killing continues, especially up in northeastern California, um, you know, places like eastern Modoc County and eastern Lassen County, these sort of last very remote redoubts this is where the California volunteers are having trouble finding people. And they also hunt people down. You know, they chase them up into Oregon, they chase them into Nevada. They're, they're really quite thorough because they're heavily armed, they're signed up, and they haven't been sent east. And this is what they think they ought to do. And they're receiving directives from the top, from the generals in charge of the whole Pacific Department of the U.S. Army. I've been working on a project relating specifically to the Mojave Desert. And it's, I've actually been told by the number one authority of that, of that region, uh, Mojave Road, that more often than not, the US military protected those Indians from white people rather than the other way around. Well, this is one of the things that my book challenges. A lot of evidence to the contrary. 
that assumption. Even for that region? You know, the, the, the standard text of the U.S. Army in the 1850s in the coastal region is called regulars in the Redwoods, and it makes the same assertion about the Redwood region. The U.S. Army in this period actually killed far more California Indians than the militia did. They were second only to the vigilantes. And when they weren't killing California Indians, they were very often supplying arms, ammunition, accoutrements, and even the officers to lead the volunteer militia. So the army was quite involved, and when I think about the Mojave War, that was primarily the U.S. Army. But to that yes. region, by the way, the very first state militia campaign was to the Colorado River Basin. That's the very first of the 24 militia campaigns. That's where they go. There, there's a fair amount about that region. Well. I have a second question. Um, so you've talked a little bit about sort of the legal uh, ramifications of uh, the gen term genocide. Um, I was wondering, are there, do you still see echoes of sort of the legal regime? Like I know um, during the Bush administration, some of the MODOC cases were cited uh, for like the detention of enemy combatants. Would terming the California Indian genocide a genocide have any impact on US case law? in terms of precedents that were established in the 19th century? I think it would, but I think a legal scholar would be better okay. positioned to think about all the ways that that would echo um, into the present. I will say that I think we have a long way to go. When I look at what's happening at Standing Rock with the Dakota Access Pipeline, it's shocking to me. It's hard to imagine a private security firm beating unarmed women and children peaceful male protesters and unleashing attack dogs on them, and it receiving so little public recognition, so little. You know, it's, it's, a major, it's a major thing happening. I'm the chair of American Indian Studies at UCLA. Um, a whole lot of the faculty and students have gone to Standing Rock, but it doesn't even seem to merit mention in our own school newspaper that we have a delegation of seven undergraduates going to spend two weeks there in the middle of the academic term. Um, issues in Indian country still are highly under-recognized and under-publicized. And I think part of the reason for that is not that these things are happening in remote locations, but because they force people to really think about the foundations of US history. If you think seriously about the population collapse in California, population cataclysm in the United States as a whole, you have to think seriously about the origins of this country. Because this population cataclysm, whatever was the driving factor, is what cleared millions of acres for agriculture, for forestry, for mining, for oil exploitation. It's the foundation upon which the modern United States was built. So the world in which we live, the wealth that we have, as U.S. citizens is largely predicated on this population collapse. So how you understand the American Indian population catastrophe directly informs how you understand the making of the United States, the country that you live in. It's a pretty heavy, fundamental issues that ultimately force us to address who we are and what we're doing, what the moral ramifications are of our insurmountable, but extraordinarily difficult, given everything. Well, I'll say two things about that. <coughs> when I published that 
piece in the LA Times, my op-ed, asking state officials to at least acknowledge this. I was staggered by the hate that showered on me. Um, and while I was sort of processing that, and you know, the comments were just, you can look at the comments of Myriad following that on the LA Times site. I was being interviewed by a reporter from Newsweek who did a story about it. <coughs> and he said, first rule of journalism is that you never look at the comments. That's <laughs> <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know that. I didn't know that. I just found that out. <laughs> um, and, then, and then I was talking to John Lithgow, and he said, well, you have it easy because you don't have to go on stage and see them mouthing the worst part of the review to you as you get on the boards. But seriously, the, the other thing that I want to say about it is that there is a silver lining here, which is that the period that this book describes is a much less democratic period than the one we live in today. Most of us in this room probably couldn't vote in California in the 1850s. None of the women in this room would be allowed to vote, none of the people of color, uh, probably none of the Jews. So it's a really different world. So the good news is that we have a political voice and California is one of the last progressive states right now. You know, maybe the last one standing. And you know, I if you are so moved, I urge you, send an email to Boxer, Feinstein, Jerry, all of them, and say this is something that should be recognized. I feel strongly about this. You can do that. You know, that's your that's your democratic right, and that's how this will get moved forward. It it won't it won't just be Jerry Brown reading this book, which, by the way, he is right now. Um, it will be all of us changing the shape of the future by writing letters and by being activists. You know, we need a, I'm not going to do it, but maybe somebody wants to set up a move.org or a change.org petition and get 100,000 Californians to sign a petition saying, we want our governor or our assemblyman or our state senators acknowledge this. That, that's, that's how it will happen. That's, that's how we'll move forward. But there will be people who will tell us to lay off the fire water, as I've been told before, by people who don't like this message. That will happen. That's, but that's part of political change. That's part of the process. So the, the Cherokee removal, the Trail of Tears, killed somewhere between four and 10,000 people, both before, during, and after the actual forced removal part of that history. But that is only one chapter in the vast forced removal of the 1830s and 1840s that forced most indigenous people living east of the Mississippi to move west of the Mississippi, primarily to be settled on reservations in places like Arkansas and 